What is a copycat crime? A copycat crime refers to a criminal act that is imitated or inspired by a previous crime, often following exposure to media content or live examples of criminal behavior. A monkey see, monkey do if you will. It occurs when individuals replicate specific criminal tactics or methods they've seen or heard about, rather than copying the underlying motives or traits of the original crime. So if a crime was committed with an underlining reason behind it, whatever that may be, the copycat will not care about them and just use a part of it. The murder weapon, the target demographic, the brutality, or anything else. A study suggests that this phenomenon is widespread enough to significantly impact the overall criminal landscape, primarily by affecting how crimes are carried out rather than the reasons for committing them. Meaning that because of how common it is, it will affect the whole landscape, sometimes making it hard for the police to find the culprit. So, now that we know what a copycat crime is, let's look at some examples of copycat killers. Mark Twitchell. Who is he? And what did he decide to base his crimes on? Mark Andrew Twitchell, born on July 4, 1979, is a Canadian filmmaker who was convicted of first-degree murder in April 2011 for killing John Brian Altinga. His trial drew significant media interest, as it was claimed that Twitchell had been influenced by the fictional character Dexter Morgan. That's the gist of it. Now let's take a look at what really happened. Mark Andrew Twitchell was born in Edmonton, Alberta, and from an early age, he aspired to create blockbuster movies. He graduated in 2000 from the Radio and Television Arts Program at the Northern Alberta Institute of Technology. In 2001, he married an American woman and relocated to Illinois, but the couple divorced in 2004. In 2007, Twitchell directed Star Wars, Secrets of the Rebellion, a full-length fan film set just days before the events of Star Wars Episode IV, A New Hope. This film featured a cameo by Jeremy Bullock, the British actor famous for playing Boba Fett in the original Star Wars trilogy. Although the film remained in post-production, it was never officially released. Additionally, Twitchell wrote a buddy comedy script titled Day Players. In September 2008, he produced a short horror film called House of Cards in a garage he rented in the southern part of Edmonton. It seems like even though he had some problems in his life, he was going in the right direction. But that was going to change in the month of October of the same year. In October 2008, John Brian Altinger, a 38-year-old former oilfield equipment manufacturer from White Rock, British Columbia, interacted with Mark Twitchell on the dating website Plenty of Fish, not knowing it was Twitchell posing as a woman to lure potential victims to a rented garage he used as a film studio, intending to kill them. On October 10, Altinger told his friends he planned to meet the woman he believed he had been chatting with and shared the address Twitchell had given him. When Altinger arrived at the garage, Twitchell bludgeoned and stabbed him to death. Twitchell's attempt to burn the body failed, so he dismembered it and placed the remains in garbage bags, which he dumped into a storm sewer at 130th Avenue and 87th Street. Altinger's friends grew concerned when they received emails, supposedly from Altinger, claiming he had gone on a long trip to Costa Rica with his date. These emails were sent by Twitchell, who had broken into Altinger's condominium to access his computer. Twitchell also sent an email to Altinger's workplace resigning on his behalf, but did not provide a forwarding address for his final paycheck. When Altinger's friends broke into his condominium, they found his passport, dirty dishes, and no signs of packing, which led them to suspect foul play. The Edmonton Police Service soon launched a homicide investigation. Twitchell claimed that he met Altinger by chance and that Altinger was traveling with a wealthy woman to Costa Rica and offering to sell his Mazda 6 to Twitchell for the cash he had on hand, 40 Canadian dollars. However, police doubted Twitchell's story and impounded his laptop and car, where they found Altinger's blood in the trunk. Twitchell was arrested on October 31, 2008, and charged with first-degree murder. Before we go to the next killer, it's important to note that before his successful murder, Mark attempted to do the same thing with other unsuspected victims. Gillis Tatro, being one of them, was lucky enough to escape after being attacked by Mark with a stun baton while wearing a hockey mask. This happened in the same garage, and the reason Tatro did not report the encounter was a feeling of shame. Eriberto Seda, what's his deal? Well, Eriberto Eddie Seda, born on July 31, 1967, 
is an American serial killer known as the New York Zodiac or the Brooklyn Sniper. Between 1990 and 1993, he was active in New York City, where he killed three people and injured six others, four of them critically. Seda was arrested on June 18, 1996, and is believed to have been inspired by the San Francisco Zodiac killer, whom he admired for evading capture. Described by police as a Brooklyn-based recluse with an obsession with astrology and death, Seda was formally charged on June 21, 1996, and was convicted on June 24, 1998, and sentenced to 232 years in prison. Okay, so we kind of know what happened. So let's look a bit deeper at how he operated. Seda attacked victims throughout New York City and sent taunting messages to the police and media after each crime. These messages contained codes based on international maritime signal flags, which New York Post journalist Kieran Crowley deciphered with the help of his father-in-law, a World War II veteran specializing in cryptography and signals intelligence. The killer's letters indicated that he chose his victims based on their zodiac signs and suggested he would strike only at specific times when certain stars were visible in the night sky. To gain insights into his timing, the police consulted a professional astronomer, whose predictions about the killer's likely activity proved somewhat accurate. Seda used an improvised firearm, claiming in his messages that the absence of rifling marks on the bullets would make it harder to catch him. The New York police initially considered that the infamous Zodiac killer, who operated in the San Francisco area in the late 1960s and early 1970s, might have relocated to the East Coast and resumed his crimes after decades of inactivity. The original Zodiac killer had killed at least five people and injured two others, sending taunting letters and coded messages to the local media, and he was never identified. However, a handwriting analyst and consultation with California authorities ruled out the possibility of Seda being the same Zodiac killer. The victims that had to go through his sick games were as follows. Mario Orozco. He survived a shot in the back. Jermaine Montanestro survived a shot in the left torso of his lower body. Larry Parham survived a shot in the chest. James Jim Weber survived a shot in the buttocks. Diane Ballard. She survived a shot in the neck. Gladys Reyes. She survived a shot in the buttocks. Joseph Joe Prost died from a shot in his lower back. Patricia Font died from two shots and was stabbed over 100 times. John Diacone died from a shot in the head. For short, here is what happened. On September 22, 2006, high school student Cassie Jo Stoddart was murdered by her classmates Brian Lee Draper, born March 21, 1990, and Tori Michael Adamchik, born June 14, 1990, at her aunt and uncle's home in Pocatello, Idaho, United States. Stoddart's body was found two days later, when her relatives returned from their trip. The killers claimed that they were inspired to murder Stoddart by the slasher film Scream earning them the moniker, The Scream Killers. Adam Chick and Draper recorded videos in a documentary style where they talked about their love for horror movies, particularly Scream, and their desire to recreate a similar murder in real life. On the day of Stoddart's murder, they created a death list of other potential victims, following through with their grim plan. Both Adam Chick and Draper were sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole on August 31, 2007. It was quite a tragic story, if you ask me. But how did these murder-obsessed teenagers get to know Cassie? Cassie Jo Stoddart was a student at Pocatello High School, where Brian Draper and Tori Adamchik were also attending. Brian Draper spent much of his childhood in Utah before relocating with his family to Pocatello, Idaho. He met Tori Adamchik at Pocatello High School, where they became friends. The two boys shared a passion for filmmaking and began making their own recordings. Now that we have some basic knowledge, let's see how the murder took place. On September 22, 2006, 16-year-old Cassie Jo Stoddard was house-sitting for her aunt and uncle in Bannock County, Idaho. Her boyfriend, Matt Beckham, joined her in the evening, and classmates Brian and Tori Adamchik visited later to hang out. Before leaving, Draper secretly unlocked the basement door, allowing him and Adamchik to return unnoticed. The boys returned with masks and weapons, re-entered through the basement, and tried to scare Stoddart and Beckham with loud noises and a power outage. Beckham left around 10.30 p.m., leaving Stoddart alone. Draper and Adamchik then attacked her, stabbing her approximately 30 times, 
with 12 of the wounds potentially fatal. The investigation revealed that Draper and Adamchik had recorded their plans on videotape before the murder. This evidence was key in their trials. Both Draper and Adamchik were convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. These were the cases I chose for today. If you found them interesting, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe. Thank you for watching. If you like this video or found it interesting, don't forget to leave a like, subscribe, and check out one of these other ones. I'm sure you will like it.